I'm Annette Insdorf, delighted to welcome the creator and five of the key actors of the new Netflix series, Transatlantic. Besides Anna Winger, we have Gillian Jacobs, Corey Michael Smith, Lucas Englander, Delilah Piasco, and Corey Stoll. This seven-part limited series is based on a novel by Julie Oringer, The Flight Portfolio, which was inspired by some real people and seismic events. The book and series are both set in Marseille in 1940-41, when the Emergency Rescue Committee managed to save over 2,000 refugees from the Nazis. Its beating heart was Varian Fry, an American journalist who risked his life to protect endangered Jews. First, they congregated at the Hotel Splendide, whose inhabitants included the German intellectual Walter Benjamin. Once the German occupation of France spread from Paris to the so-called free zone in the South, the lucky few of the victims found refuge in the Villa Herbel, where much of transatlantic is set. We're going to start with Anna Winger, uh, your previous series include the highly successful Unorthodox, as well as Deutschland 83. You're an American who's been living in Berlin for two decades. How did Transatlantic percolate in your brain, and how did you collaborate with your co-creator, Daniel Hendler? So um, the idea for the series actually sort of per began to percolate a long time ago because there is a very Fry Strasse that runs through Potsdamer Platz. And um, my father told me the story of the emer emergency rescue committee because we were uh, walking through Potsdamer Platz together. So it was, that was where I first learned about it. And then, you know, in 2015, there was a moment when uh, a million, around a million people moved to Berlin from, um, from mostly from Syria re as refugees. And there was a huge effort to help them resettle. And there was a lot that was going on in every capacity to sort of help with that, uh, with their experience. And um, it was something that affected all of us living here in Berlin. And um, during that time, I started to think about, you know, the cycle of history, the fact that, you know, people like us had had to leave Berlin as refugees. And now people were coming to Berlin seeking refuge and I remember this story. And um, when I was making Unorthodox, uh, we started researching the story. And then Julie Oranger's book came out. And, you know, it just seemed like his mint was like, this is, we should make this uh, as a series. And we started working on it. And um, so it was, in a way, it's a story about one refugee crisis that was inspired by another. But, you know, in the end, we ended up shooting it. Um, the war in Ukraine started three days after we started shooting. And so we, uh, you know, we were watching, you know, Delilah, who plays Lisa Fitko and Walter Benjamin going over the Pyrenees while we were watching on our phones during breaks and, um, you know, people lined up at the Polish border. So it's, it, it has been, you know, it's that Mark Twain quote that history doesn't repeat itself, uh, but it rhymes. Yeah. Wow. Well, I've been familiar with the story of Varian Fry for decades, considering him this really quiet hero of World War II. I've seen documentaries about him, like um, Assignment Rescue from 1997. There was a mm -hmm. fiction film about him called Varian's War from 2001 <laughs> with William Hurt. And one of the films that I presented at the 92nd Street Y Live, uh, this was about 2016, was uh, Defying the Nazis, The Sharps War with oh. my guest uh, Ken Burns, and it features Varian Fry. I also mm -hmm. Sorry? I never saw that. That's a, I'm going to look it up. It's, it's mm. actually very strong. And, and the voice of uh, Sharp is Tom Hanks. Um, mm. And the documentarian Pierre Sauvage has been making a film about Varian Fry uh, called And Crown Thy Good, while Columbia University, where I teach, has an entire Varian mm. Fry archive, archive. So this is by way of preparation for Corey Michael Smith to talk about um, how you prepared to play Varian Fry who was not a, shall we say, very demonstrative character. He was, you know, very kind of a quiet hero, as I say. Uh, well, there were various avenues of preparation. Um, you know, there are biographies, as you say, about Varian Fry. Uh, one in particular that I really appreciate is Andy Marino's. Um, it's quite extensive. And um, 
So I had I had biographical work to do uh, to understand his history. Um, his youth is actually rather fascinating. So I had a really great time uh, learning about his life up through university, which was uh, quite tumultuous. And um, and I developed a lot of understanding of his character through his behavior while he was younger on top of the biographical stuff uh you know this this series is inspired by julie's novel the flight portfolio which i read and then uh you know for any actor you can do as much work and investigation as you want but at the end of the day your bible is your script um so you know we we built this character uh from anna's and a script, uh, the motivations of the character are very clear. Um, his interaction with the rest of the emergency rescue committee, how they intermingle, uh, how they're brought together, whose strengths and whose weaknesses uh, sort of flex muscles at different times and how they interplay, that's all super important. Um, and like you said, his archive is at Columbia University Rare Books and Manuscript Library. And that was, I was able to go there and spend time with his things. And one of the most important things for me in preparation is finding my emotional connection. You can, you can spend hours and days, months, years reading biographical information, but if I don't have an emotional connection to this person, it's all for naught. Um, and there was something sort of sacred and holy about knowing that I'm playing this real man and holding letters, uh, correspondence between him and Eleanor Roosevelt, Marcel Duchamp, Max Ernst. Um, there, was a, uh, there was a handkerchief he had in the very back uh, among his ephemera, and it had his initials on it in a very specific way. So I asked Justine Seymour, our brilliant costume designer, if she would just like make me some extra so I could keep it in my pocket. It was small things like that that really reminded me of who he was, how how caring and thoughtful he was, uh, the sort of rigor of his mind and his education. And, um, and so that, that was maybe the most important sort of emotional connection that I had to him. Okay. Now, uh, Gillian Jacobs audiences probably know you from the TV comedy series community and your role in the fourth season of Lena Dunham's Girls. In Transatlantic, you play Mary Jane Gold, a wealthy Chicago socialite who finances the rescue for the endangered Jews at the Hotel Splendide. And I loved in the first episode how I learned that Mary Jane is generous, not only financially, when she sits at a cafe with the American consul Graham Patterson, notices a frightened woman entering, grabs a roll from the table, follows her to the bathroom, and there she not only offers help to Ursula with the roll, but exchanges her own fancy dress for Ursula's stained one. <laughs> um, I, I'd also love for you to talk about your preparation, especially because this was a real person. Yes. So uh, the real Mary Jane Gold um, in life and in our series was, uh, yes, a woman who came from considerable family wealth, who was born and raised in Chicago and uh, had moved to Europe and was living there for most of the 1930s, um, was living in Paris, um, having a sort of incredible life uh, before the war, she did in fact own and could fly her own plane. As you see in the series, that is based in fact, she had a Vega Gulp. Um, and uh, when the Nazis invaded Paris, she with a lot of other people wound up eventually in Marseille. That was not her original plan, but she chose to stay um, because this is the period before the US had entered the war. So as an American, she could have left, but she chose to stay and help fund this operation. Um, and so I was able to read her memoir, which Anna got me a copy of, um, which was an amazing insight into her perspective and thoughts um, on this experience. And uh, she, I think, said later in life that this was the most consequential year of her life. Um, she did end up leaving as in the show, end up leaving France, but then in real life returned and, and lived out the, a good portion of the rest of her life in France and died in France. So uh, I had, yes, I had her own words of directly of her experience, which was amazing. Um, but then as Corey said, 
you know, once you're starting to tackle the series itself, I have to, I have to live up to the Mary Jane gold of the scripts of the series and how she functions within that. So um, it was incredible to have all of these scripts and we were able to do table reads on Zoom like this uh, before mm -hmm. shooting. And that was wonderful as well um, to just sort of get to know each other as characters and people. Um, and for those of us that were already in Marseille, getting to hang out um, and develop that bond of the, the ERC in real life. Great. Um, in asking Corey Stoll now about preparation, I, I have to acknowledge that I'm <laughs> admiring your work, especially in lesser known films like The Good Lie and Decoding Annie Parker. I just hope people look them up and try to see these movies. You play Graham Patterson, the American Consul General in Marseille. And here's where I frankly am not sure, did Patterson really exist and how did you prepare to play him? <laughs> I'll let Anna answer that one. <laughs> Just very quick, quickly, there was a real uh, general consul and, you know, his, the idea of the character, the politics of the character, he was an antagonist for, for Varian's operation, um, but his name was Fullerton. And because we could find out really nothing else about him, we, we, we ran with it and gave him a new name. Okay. Which, which was really good for me because it was a good rationalization to be lazy and not, uh, you know, look into the real Fullerton. <laughs> he didn't write a memoir. Everybody else did, but he didn't. Yeah. <laughs> no, okay, but indeed, though, you play this opportunist character, I think, with great relish. And um, he is, if I had to identify an antagonist among the main cast, I guess it's your character. So could you talk a little about how you got into that? Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think, I think, you know, a thing that's, you know, just playing somebody who is, you know, politically uh, antagonistic to the main characters would might not be that interesting. And I think one thing that the that, that, uh, the script that, that really helped and, and and makes it richer is that it gives it um, it gives Patterson a, um, a a personal and you know a he has the sexual jealousy um, uh, plot line. Um, but also I think there's this great scene where I finally go to the villa and I see what this decadent scene, this, this avant-garde group of, of uh, from his view, very debauched people. And he's just scandalized, of course, probably incredibly aroused and wants to be on the inside of that. But I think, you know, we're we're living through a, a time like that now where, you know, I mean, the Nazis, you know, they before they started their um, invasions, they had these uh, uh, exhibits of degenerate art. And, you know, you're seeing now in Florida um, and other and other places, these um, uh Political figures who are using this uh, this this revulsion towards uh, towards things that are that are uh, outside of their worldview as a, a way to gain political power, and I think I think those things coming together is very key to uh, to, to to Patterson's uh, actions and and. Um, yeah, so that was it was it was fun to not just be, uh, you know, the the bad guy, but you know, somebody who has a real motivation of deep insecurity that uh, that, that that sort of crosses those cultural and political and personal boundaries. Now I can understand that, and it makes me remember that the American puritanical tradition is a rather old one contains huge amounts of hypocrisy, whether we're in World War II or the present. And, and by the way, I have appreciated that you've played real people before, the real ones like Ernest Hemingway in Woody Allen's Midnight in Paris and uh, Buzz Aldrin in Damien Chazelle's First Man, in which I believe Corey Michael Stewart, uh, Cor Corey Michael Smith also appeared. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm going to move to Delilah Plask Piask Delilah Piasco. 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 You Almost are like Piasco. Yeah. 
<laughs> You're one of the excellent <laughs> European actors starring in Transatlantic. I understand you were born in Switzerland, trained in Berlin. You were a permanent mm -hmm. ensemble member of the prestigious Burgtheater in, in Vienna. Could you talk about how you prepared to play Lisa Fitko, a true hero of World War II, mm -hmm. who kept taking refugees over a secret border route through the Pyrenees to safety in Spain and Portugal? Yeah, I mean, I, I read a lot about her. I read her biography in my past over the Pyrenees, and I looked up interviews and whatever I could find, I soaked in. Um, and I, I was questioning myself, like, what drives this character? And I think it was so fascinating that she was so dedicated to this mission to fight against the Nazis long before uh, Hitler took over power. And also when she um, was in exile, she printed like flyers and passed them out and try. Yeah, she was like active active in the underground resistance and she was so determined and engaged and I yeah that was really inspiring and yeah I, I find her story remarkable she escaped finally to Cuba and then the United mm -hmm. States but mm -hmm. it was 40 years later that she came into international prominence because of the two memoirs that she wrote mm -hmm. um, and it, related to this uh, for Lucas Englander you are, you're versatile polyglot because you've been appearing in films where you speak French, German, and English. <laughs> I gather you were born in Austria. You first rose to prominence two years ago in France with the award-winning pol political comedy series Parlement. And then the French movie Les Apparences led to your nomination for the Best Newcomer Award at the César, the French Oscars. Um, could you talk about preparing to play the young Albert Hirschman? He was such a central part of Varian Fry's operation. Um, Albert, when he came into my life, felt like he was fitting perfectly into what I was going through at that point. Because for the first time, I'm, I'm currently in Paris and, and I was surrounded by a lot of people from the Jewish community. And uh, mm -hmm. I also felt this place of being very open towards the research of my Jewish past. And so I received the audition and I didn't want to look at it for about 10 days because <laughs> I was like, this is too much. I can't touch it. It's not, it's, it's too much. It's too, too close. Um, and then I called my mom and she told me about my grandfather's history of himself being part of the underground between Austria and Prague and uh, him having attempted to kill Hitler with two guns, which led to him having to flee uh, the European continent over a lot of different countries into America and becoming a part of a help organization to help Austrian refugees cross the channel or cross the Atlantic. And so when Albert entered my life, it just felt like there is something that I feel not only honored, but also in a way that I need to respect about my own past, and this is a moment where I feel possible to do it. And then the research started, which therefore was already very emotionally charged, right? So all of this kind of like was like a fire burning beneath. Um, and then came the real Albert. And I ran into Jörg Bunchu, who shot a documentary about the Villa Airbell in Paris. By complete coincidence, he had a premiere at the Austrian Cultural Forum about, um, about, about the, the life of... Uh, another person who was helped by Varian Fry, and he sent me the documentary, and I was there with Ralph Amusu, who plays Paul, and uh, and we suddenly got into this story together, us two, who we know each other from private life, playing these two people alongside each other. So you see, like everything just fell into place, and um, I, as shy as I am right now to say it, but I am ever so grateful towards Anna to have given me that opportunity because it really comes from a, it comes from a place of fire, and uh, then came. I didn't want to go too much into Albert's understanding of the world of what happened after he left Marseille, because it felt like this man became such an incredible thinker. Obviously, it comes from somewhere. So I investigated the parts of the roots of this, but I didn't want to go into all the stuff he wrote afterwards. So the only the only piece of writing that I was really trying to nurture myself from was Exit Voice and, uh, Exit Voice and Loyalty. Um, where he describes the possibility of how you as a person who is who is part of a business can either if somebody's treating you unwell leave stay and be quiet or voice your concerns 
And to me, it felt like building the arc of this character was very close to this book. It was either you leave or you stay quiet or you voice your concerns. And here we have this guy who is, who is torn between love, a love that he cannot, cannot really get, a love that he wants to be able to live, but then he's torn towards the voice of, I can't stay quiet about this. And so I found myself exploring these parts very much. And, and I think I got a little bit lost in it <laughs> for some time. I think for some time I was, I was like, wow, I'm, I'm not sure what's what anymore, but it, um, he's teaching me ever since in many, many ways with many comments he made about life. And uh, I don't feel like this journey is over. I feel like, I feel like this project hopefully brings other people to also investigate these human beings because they are all so incredibly valuable to what we have nowadays established as modern society. Just looking at the artists they help, but also themselves with their thoughts. And, um, and uh, so for me, it feels like I'm continuing with Albert, a part of Albert with me to look at life kind of like inspired by this man. Look, someday I personally would love to see a mini series devoted primarily to Albert Hirschman. I mean, when I learned about him, he was born in Berlin, studied in France, London, Italy, and volunteered to fight in the Spanish Civil War. Okay, there's one level. And then after his heroism with Varian Fry, he immigrates to the United States in 41 with the help of a Rockefeller Foundation fellowship to Berkeley, enlists in the U.S. Army, goes to North Africa and Italy as part of the OSS, yep. served as an interpreter for a German general in one of the earliest World War II criminal trials, and then became a leading social scientist in the United States. Yes, he died at the age of 97 in 2012. Mm. <laughs> you just said something really crucial, I think, which is also important for all that our story tells. Albert has like had a Rockefeller, fe Rockefeller fellowship. He also enlisted in the army, but he didn't enlist in the army, nor did he take on the fellowship just like that. He took them on because he wanted to be able to stay in America. And American law at that time did not allow for people who are immigrant citizens like him to be in the States. And he was incredibly scared to be deported from the United States, which is why he enlisted in the army as well. Apart from him, obviously being somebody he was always ready to fight. Another reason was that he was traveling to the US in 41 with a fake passport and he knew he needs a way to stay. And the army is probably the safest way for people to understand that he is patriotic to that cause. Right. Um, the way we've been talking about transatlantic may suggest to viewers that this is a sort of serious historical piece. And it is not. So I'm going to ask Ada Winger, you have actually called Transatlantic a screwball melodrama. Can you elaborate on that? I think it, in terms of the approach when I was developing it, I mean, you have to imagine, like I live in Berlin. You know, I've, I've worked on a lot of Jewish, pro Jewish related projects and stuff. So people have sent me many World War II projects that I didn't want to do, right? So I, you know, I, I sort of always said I wasn't going to work on something that was uh, about World War II. But the thing I really loved about this project is that it's, um, you know, it to me it's a it's a celebration of something very specific, which is how um, you know community, friendship, romance. Um, uh, creativity, other people are like the light in the darkness, you know, and that this is in a crisis. These are the things that remind you that you're alive. And I think I hadn't really thought about it like that before I started to think about this story. And, um, you know, when I, when I started writing it, the approach, the, the thing I was really thinking about was what it was like for screenwriters like me who were living in Berlin, who were in exile in Hollywood, who were sent, you know, basically had to leave in the 30s, had gone to Hollywood, and were sitting at like the edge of the universe, looking at what was happening at home, totally anxious, having abandoned everything, you know, who were working on movies like Casablanca, To Be or Not to Be, you know, all of the movies that, by the way, I learned, in, you know, watched for the first time at Columbia in the film program, when I majored in film theory in your department. And, you know, I was, that was my sort of guide into the material. I thought like, these are the movies that were being made contemporaneously at the time when this was happening. 
And people just like me who were in exile in America were, you know, screenwriters from Berlin. They were, they were able to channel their trauma, their anxiety, all of it through humor, through romance, through all of the tools of all the genre tools of our, of what we do, you know, through entertainment, right? The great dictator. I mean, I read somewhere that, um, that like 50% of the people working on Casablanca were recent German emigres, like German Jewish emigres. And, and not just German, they were also French, like Marcel Dalio and his wife who starts uh, the Marseillaise. Yes, I mean, both on screen and off, right? But I mean, even behind the scenes. And when I imagine knowing what I know about, you know, what it was like for us in between takes, like looking at what was happening in Ukraine, I think the, um, what was it like for them between takes? Like, what were they talking about, you know? And, you know, Lubitsch never even really learned to speak English. I, you know, he was apparently at the center of this whole group of, you know, exiled uh, artists from Berlin. So it's, I, I thought that was sort of my way into the material because I thought like, because it's a celebration of this kind of life, of, of this aspect of being of the sort of, of being alive, even in, in a crisis, that seemed like the way into the material. So yeah, we really leaned into the style. I think all of us, we really leaned into the style of the films that were made at that time. Sure. And a film like uh, Lubitsch's To Be or Not To Be is of course shot in a studio in Hollywood, yeah. very stylized with process shots. Mm -hmm. Whereas Transatlantic um, was shot almost entirely, I gather, on location in Marseille in the south of France. Yeah. Wondering perhaps for each of the actors, what did it mean to be shooting in, in fact, in some of the real locations where these events took place? Um, does anyone want to address that? I mean, I'll just say quickly that, uh, you know, the, the, the experience I had, like holding Varian's actual correspondence and photographs and ephemera the feeling was not dissimilar being able to be shot in location knowing mm -hmm. that this is this is where things happen it sort of is like beyond homage to these people you know it feels incredible to be reliving history to be sharing these in many ways unknown events to so many people uh you know to turn the Hotel Splendide, which is now just an administrative building, back into the Hotel Splendide because the owner of the building knew Varian Fry's story and was allowing um, the team to, to completely redesign this hotel, to rebuild out the lobby, to have the French National Police storming the hallways of the hallways where the <laughs> refugees were actually hiding out. I mean, that is an incredible way to retell this story to share this story with the world um and i'm really grateful that anna was insistent that this was shot in marseille using using the city not in a studio we were on the streets we were in the buildings and so there's like there's a realness that as an actor i mean it's really hard to beat Although I, I just want to say, just for the record, that it's a highly fictionalized account of this story, right? I mean, I you know, I recently had the uh, privilege of watching um, parts of Pierre Sauvage's movie in progress, his documentary in progress, and I literally wept in his studio. You know, for me, it was it was kind of overwhelming to to see that he had interviewed so many of the real people involved, Lisa, Mary Jane. And um, and many of the people that we like Charlie Fawcett and Miriam Davenport, who we ultimately didn't include in the story, because actually there were so many people involved in this. It was a big group, the ERC, and we had to make choices of what we could fit into the space that we had. And of course, we're fictionalizing, you know, romance and conversations and, you know, those things. But we tried to stay true to the achievements um, and their intent, you know. But um, but it, it this is highly fictionalized. It's it's uh it's even fanciful in some places, but all with with the right intentions, you know. It's um so train staying true to the spirit of it. And we were very lucky that the city allowed us to shoot and we shot in the real Comte de Mille, in the real Fosset Nicolas, in in the Hotel Splendide, the real um Villa Arabelle had been torn down, but we um found one very nearby that had basically not been touched since the 40s. It didn't even have indoor plumbing. It was an incredible place. It was just waiting for us, I think. Um, 
And so, yeah, that was, it was to, to summon those ghosts was an incredible experience. I'm actually going to focus this now on Lucas because your character, if I remember correctly, in the first episode, I first became aware of Lucas when he, I'm sorry, of uh, Albert, when he sees the ocean. I mean, here, these refugees have been straggling and trying to get somewhere. And he's so excited by the sight of the sea that he just runs, strips off his clothes and jumps in. <laughs> and you were really presumably in the Marseille area. So I guess I'm, I'm asking not just the relocations, but the space of Marseille itself, which is one of the beautiful cities of France, whether it was during World War II or now, but especially for Lucas, you know, was that the, did you shoot in sequence? In other words, you jumping into the ocean, was that one of the first things you did in the film? No, <laughs> no, unfortunately not. But it was a very, very special moment for me as well. It felt, it felt completely surreal. It felt like to even, you know, it feels so strange. I'm a very privileged guy when it comes to my life. I have a normal standard of living. I'm not going through the situation to be allowed to empathize in this way where you try to create an emotional connection and therefore try to respect certain things and try to scream for joy, not for yourself, but for the hope that you might feel when you could see the future being bright, um, was just as an actor, incredible to experience. That's all I can say to that. Marseille itself felt to me when it comes to Albert, just like a city. I did not feel like I was searching for things. I feel, felt like I was living through things. I felt like I was kind of uh, being a kid in the streets and trying to, you know, uh, be with the people. And I met a, a great amount of crazy people in Marseille. Gillian and I had a great moment in the very beginning. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. We, we went, what's the part of town? What's it called? Uh, the oldest part, the, the, the was, narrow passageways. It's, oh, the panier. Yeah. The panier. Lucas and I were walking around really like a day after we arrived. And um, this man just started yelling at us from his second story apartment window. And he and Lucas got into a philosophical debate from the ground level and the street level. And he was, and it was like, <laughs> welcome to Marseille. It was an amazing moment. The guy was yelling at me, stop saying why. Why do you want to say why to everything in life? I'm like, I don't know, because I want to understand why. And he's like, you're going to you're gonna be that guy. You're going to die. And then when you wake up, when you're dead, you're going to be like, why am I dead? <laughs> and then he threw <laughs> candies at us. So Marseille yes, felt yeah, like yes. a home. Yeah, it felt like, you know, it felt like we were just, I was just living this place. And by doing so, it felt like through this connection that therefore was established, Albert was living this place, you know. And I think like, I don't know what it's like for you all, but like when, whenever I feel like I'm opening up for a character, it feels like I'm opening one part of myself very wide and closing down <laughs> with, with, um, with Albert, like certain parts were open that wanted to be a part of also, let's say a few darker places of the city, or at least get like a look at them or a wink. And uh, so I think Marseille showed me a lot and I'm grateful. <laughs> And, and actually, Delilah, I mean, there are wonderful scenes where your committed principal character physically has to lead people over the Pyrenees. Mm -hmm. but, um, were those the actual real spaces more or less? And, you know, how, how did the actual landscape inform your performance? I mean, it was so beautiful. It was amazing. It was like this, really this paradise and it was really hard because actually the circumstances were so terrible and you, it, it was, it was such a contrast, you know, to like try, try to, uh, went into this horrible situation where they are and tried to survive. And, you know, it was a really um, dangerous path, but also it was just so beautiful and it's, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Anybody it else? It was surreal. It was totally surreal. Yeah. Um, now, for Anna, Transatlantic incorporates some of the famous artists and intellectuals that Fry and the uh, ERC saved, including Marc Chagall and Hannah Arendt, Andre Breton, Max Ernst. 
It also foregrounds a few elements that I was less aware of. Your ensemble includes two African young men who work at the front desk of the Hotel Splendide. And in episode three, one of them, Paul, begins to espouse revolt, which grows through the next episodes. So I'm really interested to what extent were Africans a part of the Marseille resistance? Well, you know, when I first started figuring out how to locate the story in Marseille, uh, we started doing a lot of um, research about what was happening in Marseille at that time. And it, it feels like everything was happening in Marseille at that time, which was really exciting. It was kind of this crossroads of many different people's resistance projects. Um, first of all, there was the special operations executive and the beginnings of British intelligence, where they were trying to get, I mean, they weren't spies exactly. It was more like they were trying to get um, resistance, anything. You know, you have to imagine that in this slice of history, uh, in 1940, um, you know, Paris has fallen. Italy is fascist. Spain is fascist. Germany is fascist. Eastern Europe is under German control. You know, it's it, it's looking really bad for us, right? Like this is not a good moment in the war. The Americans haven't gotten in, and um and the and the British are fighting the Nazis alone, and so they're trying to run people who they couldn't be British, right? So some of them were Americans, famously Josephine Baker, um you know, other people, Canadians, um and. Possibly, you know, one very sexy, you know, uh, Palestinian Jew. But um, <laughs> I, I was interviewed about Amit Rahaf's character. He is fictional, but um, but you know, that character was written for him. Um, but there was all kinds of people who were trying to start something, and at the same time, there was all of the people who'd been brought by the French from French colonies abroad, right? Like so, from uh, Central Africa, from Northern Africa, some for, even from Asia who had been brought to fight the Nazis in France, in the immigrant armies, in which were also many Jews from Eastern Europe, from Germany, who were already exiled in Paris, also joined the immigrant armies. And so they were fighting the Nazis and the Nazis took Paris and all of them were released from service. It was like they just put down their guns and that was that, right? Because they were, the French effectively switched sides. So they, they were no longer, these, these immigrant armies were no longer necessary. And what I thought was really interesting in the research was the idea that as a result of having been brought to France in this situation, all of these people spoke to each other in a way that they never would have otherwise, right? Like, I mean, effectively, it was also the beginning of the end of the colonies, right? Because it was a kind of communication around, you know, common oppression in, in colonial life worldwide. And all these people were in France. And so in that and because everybody kind of ended up in Marseille, which was the last free zone in Europe. I mean, in that part of Europe, anyway, they, um, you know, they were they were talking to each other, and so there were there were there was a lot within the French resistance about resistance cells that were started by people from these immigrant armies and collaborations between, let's say, people like Paul and Albert, who were from different parts of the world but had met, you know, in the context of this kind of migration, you know, and, and they had both been in, in the French military before. So I thought that was really interesting. It's like, I mean, in a way, the story in, in every way, let's say, both because of the Americans and the Europeans, but also the Africans, is, is a story about people whose lives cross paths in this moment, who would never cross paths otherwise. And then this kind of magic comes of that. And I, I think I find that very uh, special. Sure. Um, in preparation for our conversation, I actually went through very carefully who directed which episode, because this is seven parts that Netflix is presenting. Uh, and I, I realized that episodes one through four are directed by Stéphanie Chua and Véronique Raymond. And I think five through seven is Mia Marielle Mayer. Mm -hmm. And um, I was curious for the actors, um, whether there was uh, any sense of whether how did you keep the coherence when you were <clears throat> in fact being directed by different people playing the same role um and was it shot with episode one two three four first and then the others or was some of the shooting in fact overlapping episodes <laughs> it was overlapping i mean we make TV uh, uh, probably different than they do in America. So, <laughs> you know. 
I I'll have not thought all that differently. I mean, we the, the two Corys and I can speak to American television. I, I mean, it, that that certainly happens. Um, Does it? I mean, I, I, I mean, the show community that I was on was uh, a legendarily chaotic production. So that this felt not dissimilar to me in terms of like going right. back and finishing scenes from episodes once you've already moved on. I'm I'm familiar with that. It's maybe not mm-hmm. standard, but I've experienced it before. But uh, it was I, I I really feel indebted to uh, Steph and Vero, our first block directors, because they um, have an incredible sense of physicality and space and they are um two very elegant and commanding women and Mm -hmm. i am not a refined uh lady in my day-to-day life and i aspired to uh to live up to my hair makeup and wardrobe as mary jane and um so stefan would tell me like no 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 don't sit like that (laughs) that doesn't look right hold your purse like this you know cross your leg like this they they really helped me so much and i mean i was already pushed there by the hair makeup and wardrobe and then they sort of gave me the rest i felt like um and then, it, yeah, it was great to have Mia come in. But I, I think the wonderful thing about television is that there is always the continuity of the writers. So it is, you know, this show began with Anna. It, she's overseeing the entire production. So even when directors are changed, it is we are led by the guiding vision of Anna. So that helps also just sort of like keep a consistency of the production, um, regardless of what elements are changing. But um to my mind, it was not that dissimilar. I don't know, Corey and Corey, you yeah. can. I, I found the difference between the dire- directors to be helpful, actually, because uh, you know Stephanie and, Ver- and Veronique, uh, they were like obsessed with the business of you know of the, the you know there were all these like little weird stuffed animals and trinkets on my desk and 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 a lot of the more sort of screwball stuff. They were just really into that, and then. Mia, I found was 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 much more fixated on or focused on on story, and uh, you know, and really hitting these beats, these character beats, and it and it fit because as the story goes on, uh, the you know, my the, the stakes get higher with my character, and and, and the scenes become more serious. Um, so you know, we 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 have that consistency with with the writing and with the cast, and I think it's always helpful to bring in these new perspectives with the new director. Um, in terms of, uh, I'm sorry, did someone want to say something? No. In terms of working with directors, um, I, I did want perhaps to invoke some of the other films that one or two of you have made for comparative purposes. I mean, Corey Michael Smith, you are in the very, very best film that I think was released in 2022 in the United States, which nobody saw, called <laughs> The Same Storm. Uh, directed, written and directed by Peter Hedges. You were also in Lisa Cholodenko's series, Olive Kittredge, and she was my assistant at Columbia at one point. Um, Todd Haynes in, in the superb film Wonderstruck and Carol in Phyllis Nagy's uh, Call Jane with Sigourney Weaver. Can you compare um, sort of what the directors of Transatlantic were able to bring out in you compared to some of these amazing directors you've worked with? Oh gosh. Uh, well, um, it's quite a spectrum of directors you've listed, though. Uh, <laughs> though I feel uh, comfortable saying I, I, you've you've named people I, I really have high regard for um, and enjoyed working with. I suppose um, people that I respond to the most uh, are directors whose um sensitivity is a part of their onset decorum um I, I find that you know some directors are a bit more of um uh it can be a bit more of a general perhaps because there's always limited time and uh the cash register is constantly dinging in the back of the head so you're aware of time and money um but what I really appreciated um, on this on this series, Transatlantic, was our director's sensitivity to these characters' plight. It was 
really very important, especially for me, that Varian always have an awareness of the magnitude and the gravity of his responsibility and sort of stress of the concern of failure. Um, and I, I felt really safe, especially establishing the beginning when we were really uh, orienting to the story and the universe and the world. I felt really, really safe with Stephanie and Veronique um, building this story. And uh, I, I don't know how to compare it exactly to other people, but you know, Peter Hedges is someone who was also very sensitive, felt very comfortable with him. Todd Haynes, I, I just shot my third film with Todd Haynes in the fall. He's like a, a, a master and often has this like childlike wonder and fascination of the actual magic of movie making. Um, the man is incredibly prepared. He always knows his references ahead of time, but I always feel safe around him. I guess I've just been really lucky working with people where I've I have felt really protected and safe so that I'm able to be like immensely vulnerable, which is just hugely important to me. Well, they've been very lucky to work with you as well. You. Um, and, and for Corey Stoll, I, I was reflecting last night on your filmography because I've seen at least 15 films in which you've appeared. And I noticed how many of them were really strong ensemble pieces. Um, I, you're going to get to do a few more leads, I'm sure. But um, I was thinking about Hey, you've worked with the big ones like Spielberg, you know, in West Side Story as Lieutenant Schrank, with Woody Allen in both Cafe Society and uh, Midnight in Paris. Sean Levy, who I whose work I really appreciate. Well, he was once my student at Yale, but um, this is where I leave you. Uh, Tim Blake Nelson's film Anesthesia that I presented at the 92nd Street Y with him as my guest. I mentioned The Good Lie from 2013, which I hope people see, directed by Philippe Falardeau. It was such a moving drama based on the experiences of the lost boys of Sudan around 2000, who were relocated from a Kenyan refugee camp to America, Shades of Transatlantic, co-starring Reese Witherspoon. Um, and again, I, I'm, if I can pose this question in terms of comparative, you know, whether it's the directors of Transatlantic or any of the ones I mentioned, what is it that best elicits in you the richness of performance? I think it's, I think the best gift a, a director can give a cast is a clear point of view that brings everybody into the same world, not just the cast, but also the costume designer and the sets and, uh, and, and then on all the background. Um, you know, the more everybody is, working in the same direction, telling the same story, the, the better it'll be and the easier our job will be. Um, you know, I think, you know, as actors, we all want to stand out and have our moments. Um, but uh, the, the, the job is to, is to tell, is to tell the story and to, and to be of service to the, to the writer and, and, and to the director. And so I think those, those directors who have a clear sense of the story they want to tell are going to, are going to elicit the best performance, at least the, the performance that's going to serve the story itself. Sorry. And Lucas, um, because you studied at the Stella Adler studio in New York city, I'm wondering whether there's a difference when you are performing in an ongoing series, like you did Catherine the Great with Helen Mirren, The Witcher and Transatlantic, or individual feature films? <laughs> mm, I think if anything, then it's probably the pace when it comes to the difference between films and series. But like, to me, um, when it comes, are, are you asking specifically about directors and series and movies, or are you asking more about my experience? Of experience. I think it's really about the story we're telling. So to me, I, I'm lucky to right now, I guess, be in a time where series are getting more and more depth and we're exploring things that are, that, that to my understanding have previously only been explored in films. Um, and, uh, 
And so it feels like a lot of a lot of times we're allowing ourselves to experiment in series the way that you very often would have maybe only experimented in movies, where you allow for kind of this the beasts in us all to to come out and we're not afraid of of sharing them with each other. And I think that supported a good director, I have to bring that in for me, supports that place, no matter whether it's a series or whether it's a movie or whether it's a performance art piece or anything else. It's just this place of like, if they tap into my soul and bring out the, the, that, oomph, you know, and if that can combine with the oomph <laughs> of the other actors, I think then that, that makes for a great piece. And it can be happening. It can be found anywhere, maybe even in street theater of a an amateur group. <laughs> um, and actually, I, I've learned that Gillian Jacobs in 2015, you directed a short documentary, "The Queen of Code," about Grace Cooper, who was a rear admiral in the Hopper. U.S. Yeah, Grace Hopper, Hopper. Right. and yeah. a computer scientist who ushered in the digital era. And you starred in a feature released earlier this year, "The Seven Faces of Jane," whose Episodes are directed by talents, including Gia Coppola, uh, San Cassavetes, Ken Jong, one of your uh, community castmates, and you, you directed. Um, is there more directing of film and television on the horizon for you? And has Transatlantic informed that at all? Oh, that's so interesting. I was I was actually thinking about Grace Hopper as you were speaking earlier, because that was really my only other experience with a story set in World War II. So she was a mathematics professor at Vassar who um, enlisted in the Women's Volunteer Navy, the Waves, um, and was desperate to help in the war effort. Uh, one of her grandfathers had been a rear admiral, so she was really desperate to join the Navy, and they kept rejecting her. She basically demanded that they accept her, and then after she went through basic training, they didn't really know what to do with her, um, but they sent her to Harvard. There was a secret computer um project happening at harvard and so she ended up uh being sort of put in a room and this is a time when computers were the size of the room you see behind me and she was told to write a manual for it and she had never seen a computer before she didn't know what they were but they're like you're a mathematics professor go at it and so by the end of the war she had become an expert in these earliest days of computing she was feeling so fulfilled by being um, a part of the Navy and being at Harvard. And then when the war ended, um, they essentially kicked all of the women out of the military service. They wouldn't allow them to continue. And then Harvard also didn't have female professors. So she was sort of dismissed from Harvard as well um, and ended up having a really incredible career in computing um, for decades rejoined the Navy, rose to the rank of Rear Admiral, and basically was forced into retirement. I think she was one of the oldest people in active service. Um, and by the end of her life, the Navy had really come to embrace her as this figure to um, get people interested in computing in the Navy. And they sent her on nationwide speaking tours for years. She appeared on David Letterman. She became a sort of well-known figure, always dressed in her in her Navy blues and her, her Admiral's uniform. Um, so that was really sorry that was long winded, but that was uh, that was my only other. Um, and then I, I actually directed. I have a weird side interest in STEM, even though I don't know anything about it. I somehow keep finding that I'm making stories about it. So actually, when we were shooting when we were shooting this, I, I directed another documentary about a high school robotics competition called More Than Robots that's on Disney Plus and it premiered while we were shooting Transatlantic. So um, I would like to continue directing. Yes. Um, uh, I don't know what documentary I would like to do next or if it would be scripted, but um, I really found it enjoyable and kind of to your point of all our experiences with different directors and, and how that affects us. And as actors, I can say from my limited experience directing, that also has a huge impact on me as an actor on set. So going from directing back to being on set just as an actor, I, I, I think I view sets in a very different way way now um so it's been incredibly instructive to have that experience well some of my takeaway from this discussion is i'm waiting for a, a fiction film about albert hirschman and now i'd like to see one about grace hopper too mm -hmm. um i would love to discuss further but i know our time is almost up i'm just going to say that 
By the time the Emergency Rescue Committee ended its Marseille operation in 1941, September, when the French expelled Varian Fry, his group had helped about 2,000 people escape from France, from German-occupied France. And it wasn't until 50 years later, in 1991, that the U.S. government recognized the Varian Fry group for its heroic accomplishments. Now, more than 30 years later, he and Albert Hirschman, Lisa Fitko, Mary Jane Gold, and others are back on our radar through Transatlantic. So please, everyone, watch it on Netflix. And thank you, Anna Winger. Thank you, these great actors, for bringing this story to us now. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for having me.